Farming in America could not exist without John Deere. I don't care where you are, in the rural parts of America, there's farmland, and you're inevitably going to see green tractors. Specifically in the Midwest, where people who've had deer machines for generations say that their family bleed green. It's really to that extent. But John Deere's tractors aren't the only thing bleeding green. John Deere is on pace to have its most profitable year ever. John Deere is forecast to make about $7.7 .7 billion in the fiscal year 2021. That would be a record. But while John Deere shareholders and executives could not be happier, John Deere has been in a battle on two fronts. Between a massive union strike from upset workers and a legal battle with farmers concerning equipment repairs called right to repair, John Deere must convince their customers and their employees that they care about more than just profits. This is The Breakdown. There's a saying that you'll hear either deer say or other people say, if farmers are profiting, deer's profiting. And deer wants to do everything they can to make those farmers uh, a lot more profitable. Since the pandemic hit in 2020 and millions of Americans sheltered in place buying nothing but groceries, both John Deere and farmers became even more essential in feeding America and both profited a great deal as a result because the machines that they make are essential to an industry that has to provide an essential product for consumers, not only in the United States, but across the globe. John Deere's profits during the pandemic are eye-popping, and that wealth has spread out to executives like CEO John May, who brought in $15.6 million in 2020, a 160% raise. And according to our Bloomberg data, he's gonna make about 30 million for the 2021 fiscal year. So you're talking about almost $10 million more for the CEO earnings. Shareholders also saw their slice of the pie, in part because of John Deere's stock buybacks. Buybacks are a piece of financial engineering by a company to repurchase shares of its own stock to reduce the number of shares in the market, which in turn increases the ownership stake for the shareholders. The stock buybacks for them have been significant. So in the past 12 months, they bought back $1.9 billion in stock and they bought back 716 million alone in their fiscal third quarter of 2021. One group who thought they were not sharing in that wealth, John Deere factory workers. So the optics are obviously looking bad for the company now that a labor strike has broken out among um, part of their workforce. During this boom time, Deere offered their workers a 5% pay increase. That's when over 10,000 United Auto Workers who worked for John Deere went on strike. I had one person in particular say, our CEO is about to make $10 million more for this year than he did last year. The company is seeing earnings go to records. The stock price is surging. And yet we're the group who, during the past recession and past down economic cycles in the farming industry, we took cuts. After the union turned down two contracts, John Deere was finally able to meet their demands in late November, which doubled raises and improved pensions for union members. Those employees that are represented by the UAW are immensely valuable employees to us. We're super proud of where the contract ended up. It's groundbreaking in a lot of ways, both from, from uh, near-term wage increases, as well as the retirement medical benefits that it offers. It's super helpful to understand how the work is done in the factories, what the opportunities are to make improvements for whatever the operation happens to be to make the lives of those that are doing that work better. So while John Deere workers fought and won their battle to see the profits the company has brought in over the past two years, farmers are still in their own fight with Deere when it comes to repairing their own equipment. So a lot of farms our size use a variety of technology. We use old technology, we use new technology. 
My name is Tom Brandt and you are currently in Plymouth, Nebraska. I am a farmer and also a state senator. I represent District 32, Fillmore Thayer, Jefferson, Saline, and southwestern Lancaster counties here in Nebraska. The state of Nebraska's agriculture is the fourth largest ag powerhouse in the nation. We feed way more people with the food we produce than just the 1.96 million people here in the state of Nebraska. The farm that you're on today is a farm that's common to southeast Nebraska. We rotate corn and soybeans. It takes hundreds of thousands of dollars to operate a small farm like this. Our margins are razor thin. Farming is an industry where we buy retail and we sell wholesale. While the principles of farming remain the same, the equipment used to farm has changed dramatically. This is a 1952 Alice Chalmers WD. Uh, this is a style of tractor I grew up on in the 60s and 70s. This tractor has not started for two months. It's tough and it works. And this is what American farm equipment used to be like. Farming equipment from both John Deere and their major competitors has become much more technologically sophisticated in the past two decades. A little after 2000, tractors changed from being strictly just a power and uh, source and got to be a lot more computerized. Now they're all basically drive-by wire systems where there's no physical connection between any of our controls in the tractor except a piece of wire. And every generation of tractor since is even more computerized. It surprises people every day how technologically sophisticated the equipment is, whether that's you know GNSS satellite guidance uh, in, in our equipment, or whether it's the digital information that comes off those equipment that helps make uh, customers, uh, enable them to make better decisions every day. This is the main computer screen right here. It can show us moisture, it can show us yield, uh, it can show us the various components on the combine. 20 years ago, our irrigated corn probably yielded 150, 60 bushels to the acre. This last crop we just harvested, we did 250 bushels to the acre. So if your crops are gaining yield 40% over 10 or 20 years, you're going to need bigger, faster equipment to harvest it. And those bigger, faster machines have increased productivity an estimated 1.4% per year over the past 70 years. And U.S. farmers now produce an average corn yield of about 175 bushels an acre. And then the really valuable information that starts to move markets is what the harvest looks like. So now uh, one of these enormous harvesters will tell in real time through this modem under the farmer's rear end back to deer and who knows where, to Goldman Sachs maybe, exactly how much corn or wheat is being harvested on that farm acreage at that moment. It's really staggering. We can get a lot more done in a day. We can work longer hours especially with uh, auto steer, auto guidance systems. We can get a lot more hours in. We're not tired at the end of the day. So the efficiency factor is great when it works. And unfortunately, like all electronics, it doesn't always work. And that's where there's a catch. While the technology in a John Deere tractor or combine makes farming easier than ever before, there are very real concerns from some farmers when it comes to repairing that equipment, because as of right now, they can't. John Deere and other agricultural machinery companies won't let farmers fix their own equipment without a licensed mechanic. For Deere and its dealerships, parts and services are three to six times more profitable than sales of original equipment, according to company filings. Historically, farmers have always repaired their own equipment. Farmers love to tinker. I will grant that. We all like to tinker with our equipment, and we all modify our equipment. The right to repair 
gets down to the nuts and bolts that currently farmers don't have access to the computer systems on their farm equipment. It doesn't matter whether it's green John Deere or it's red case or Agco's, they're all proprietary. They won't let us in on that. The thing that you fix on the tractor isn't necessarily like a moving part. It may be something that has to be fixed in the software or like hitting a reset button for your computer. We've had a few cases where we get an error code on the panel and it is basic, you look it up and it says, call your dealer. So the dealer has to come out and they plug their computer into the tractor and they have to diagnose what the problem is. We have operators who have had computer glitches during planning. They have a newer tractor, they have a newer planner. It happens on a Friday. They gotta wait till Monday to get it fixed. They've lost two and a half days. If they were given access to the operating system, they knew what they had to do to repair that. And there are literally billions of dollars at stake for John Deere when it comes to repairs. They make a lot of their money in the dealerships from parts and repair because, frankly, they have a monopoly. And that monopoly has been significantly enhanced by the software controls and the modern tractor. No one else can work on them. Annual parts sales increased 23% to $6.8 billion from 2013 to 2020, while Deere's total agricultural equipment sales fell 20% to $22.3 billion. So there's very real money at stake when it comes to repair. If a right to repair law allowed parts and services markets to compete, it could be a huge blow to a vital income stream for the company. The farmers of the world say, we've been repairing these things forever. Farmers know how to fix things, know how to keep things working in the fields. And by denying us that, you're essentially taking away a kind of birthright. John Deere is also the target of a potential federal class action lawsuit alleging antitrust violations tied to its repair policies. John Deere declined to comment on the litigation but said it meets company commitments to provide parts, information, and software to owners of its equipment. However, there is precedent when it comes to right to repair. The best way of explaining the right to repair is to go back to automobiles. As automobiles were built with more and more software and chips, it became more and more difficult for the average car owner to fix their car because the software, you didn't have the tools to do that. So in 2012, the state of Massachusetts introduced a right to repair bill on light cars and trucks. They were the only state in the nation to do that. And what that did is that opened the floodgates and made it possible for third party mechanics, the mom and pop, to access and repair all those vehicles. I can tell you locally, we have a situation just like that. Last January of 2021, based on the fact that the Farm Bureau membership overwhelmingly wanted to see a right to repair bill, we introduced one. That bill, called LB 543, was voted in favor 176 to 1 by the farmers. Yet right now that bill sits in committee because it required amendments to only reference repairing farm equipment and not other electronics like iPhones, computers, and televisions. Our position's fairly straightforward. We believe that farmers have the right to repair their equipment. Where we draw the line is the right to modify, and it generally involves the embedded software that we put on the machines. Agricultural equipment is less like consumer electronics than it is really like uh, aviation, right? You wouldn't want just anybody fixing uh, and repairing software on an airplane because there is a safety component to it. In the same way, you know, I think a tractor going down the highway is a fairly comparable situation. That's really where, where our efforts are best spent uh, to try to make sure that people understand the ramifications and the risks associated with the, the conversations that are currently happening in the space. While farmers are waiting for a ruling to be made on right to repair, some are taking matters into their own hands by using gray market technology to run diagnostics on their own equipment. When you rebel against the technological barrier, you hack it. And 
there are a number of farmers who've availed themselves of John Deere repair and diagnostic software from places like Hong Kong and other markets where things are sold without the proper licenses. It's the software black market, or in this case, it's really a gray market. Right now, the right to repair is still moving forward. But its future is anything but certain. Currently, LB 543 is sitting in committee, and we chose to have it stay there for one year to allow all parties to give us some input on this. And it's pretty much been crickets. But the hue and cry out here in the country is getting louder. People want more regulation, or at least the opportunity to control their own destiny. They don't like seeing it in the hands of big corporations. We'll keep working at it until we get it accomplished. I'm not afraid of a fight. I haven't met a farmer yet that's not afraid of a fight. So we'll state our piece and see what we can get done. <laughs>